Welcome to Praise Community Church YouTube. We're excited to share today's sermon with you. To learn more about our church and get involved, visit praiseyear.com and follow us on social media. Make sure to subscribe and hit the bell for more sermons. We pray this message inspires and blesses you today. You guys okay? We had a, uh, have you, I, I just recently read, did you guys ever read The Three Little Pigs? You guys know that story? Do you guys know in the original version, the uh, wolf is boiled to death? He doesn't hit the water and run back out the roof like he dies. And that, yeah, that's in the original version. The original version was made in the 1800s. And I was reading that story. And I, what I think is so fascinating about that story is uh, you have these like three brothers, they get kicked out of the house. You know, the one builds the house out of hay, one builds it out of sticks, one builds it out of, out of brick. Thank you. And um, you guys are helpful. The, the, the thing that, just, that I've been really just dwelling on a lot of, it's like a lot of those old time stories have a, have a bigger point to them. And, and I was thinking about that. And instead of thinking about three brothers, I was thinking about it just being the same pig. And, and this pig has to learn how to build a house. And when you build a house out of hay and it works and it's keeping the rain out and it seems like, okay, this is a shelter I can live in. I can make my home here. And, and it's fine. And then all of a sudden, the big bad wolf comes and blows it down. It's like, oh my gosh, what happened to my house? I've got to figure out how to build a better house. So then you build it out of stick and you're like, all right, it's a little bit more sturdy. I like this. And then it comes and it's blown down. And it's like, I've got to build a better house. And the Hebrew understanding of how the, the, the brain works or how we take thoughts and ideas and knowledge and turn them into reality has a lot to do with that story. So I just want to talk to you guys about that today. Um, knowledge in the Bible would be considered the materials that you would build a house out of. And just some of you guys are not abstract thinkers. I'm going to take this slow so you get it. The spirit of the Lord, there are seven spirits of the Lord, according to Isaiah 11 and Revelation 5. Here are the spirits of the Lord. It's the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of wisdom, and the spirit of counsel. Those are four things that deal with bringing knowledge into the reality of, of who we are. How many of you guys know that you probably shouldn't eat Big Macs every day? You could know that, but how many of you guys know you could still eat Big Macs every day? So you know it, but you're not wise enough to not do that. Does that make sense? How many of you know that you, you like, you shouldn't have, like Javiba just said, debt, right? And you might know that debt is bad, but you might still have it, and you might not be paying it off, and that's probably not good, and you might be accumulating more debt. So you can know something and not have the wisdom to bring it into reality. Make sense? And so knowledge is like having the materials. Now, here are some, these are just like bricks, right? You can have, you can have the knowledge, you can have the materials, understanding is understanding how these things fit together. And it's kind of like the blueprint, but wisdom is the actual building of the materials. So you have the knowledge, which is the materials. You have the understanding of how they go together, but wisdom actually is able to put them together and actually build something out of them called your life. Do I need to go over that again? Council, let's say I was building a house. Council is bringing in the door expert or the window expert to make the best windows and doors I could possibly have. That's what council would be in the analogy. It's bringing in somebody who knows far more about something than I do. And that's called council. So knowledge, understanding, wisdom, counsel. Those four things are pretty important. There's a parable that I've gone over with you guys. And usually... Um, it's, it's the knowledge, it's the, uh, the parable at the end of the Sermon on the Mount called the foolish builder and the wise builder. Are you guys familiar with the parable that there's a, there's a wise builder and he builds his house on the rock. There's a foolish builder and he builds his house on the sand and the storm comes and blows it down. And how many of you guys have ever had your house blown down before or your life blown down? You build a life and then something happened and poof, it got blown down completely. Has that ever happened to you? It's happened to me. It's happened to me like three or four times where something happens to me that's so hard to handle that the knowledge I had wasn't enough, the understanding I had wasn't enough, and the wisdom to actually put it all together wasn't even close. And so like this storm came and absolutely just wrecked my house. 
So in my life, I'm trying to build a house that's actually made out of brick that can't be blown down. And I'm trying to take Bible verses and just not just know the Bible verse, but understand the verse and then have the wisdom to actually apply the verse. How many of you think you know more verses than you apply? Okay. Good. We're going to get somewhere today. The wise builder builds his house on the rock. Now, if you're a first-time guest, you're the one that usually blows this analogy. Okay, no pressure on you, but you usually yell at the wrong answer. Okay? What's the rock that the house is built on? You stole that from everybody. That's good, though. You know it. The rock isn't Jesus in this analogy that Jesus is saying. It's actually doing what it is you hear. For those who hear what it is I'm saying and do it, it's like a wise builder who builds his house on the rock. Hearing and doing. That's why they're wise, because they're actually able to take the knowledge, understand it, and then do it, which is actually build the house. You guys following me? We often spend our entire lives as Christians gathering building materials called scripture. And we gather so much of them, but we don't have anybody holding us accountable to applying them. And I'm telling you, if you would apply one, one Bible verse to your life, like I was just in uh, Brazil and I, my roommate was Mike Van Hall. How many of you guys know who Mike Van Hall is? He's, he did uh, loaves and fishes in China. This, this couple got radically wrecked by God, decided to give up their lives as bankers, moved to China. And there's this one verse in the Bible. It says, this is pure religion, that you would take care of widows and orphans. They gave their life to that verse. They go to China. They are pulling babies out of the trash that have special needs. They create an orphanage of like 100 children with special needs. And they have people coming in that are just loving these children and hugging them and holding them all day long. One verse. Isn't that amazing? It's just one verse. It's, it's like... To have the wisdom to take a verse and actually pull it into reality, but then to keep pulling it and keep pulling it and keep pulling it until you are the direct manifestation of a verse in the Bible. If you want to know what it looks like to believe this verse, look at that person right there. Oh my goodness. I didn't know you could take a verse that far. One verse. Do you guys know the quickest way to grow as a Christian? It's one verse. It's just one. I remember there's been times where like, if there's anything in my life worth, worth looking at, it started with a verse, just one verse. The, the enemy used to pick on me and there's some verses that apply inwardly and then there's some verses that apply outwardly. And God usually has some inward verses he wants us to understand. And I remember like when I was, um, when I was a kid, I mean, I experienced loneliness. I was the, the youngest brother, right, in my family. And so I always... When I was, I never had any time where I wasn't by myself because I was the younger brother. There was always another brother there. And so when I was the youngest in the family, I love being around people. I'm an extrovert. I'm turning into an introvert as I get older. But like when I was by myself, I experienced extreme loneliness and, and the devil used to come along. I didn't know it was the devil, but in my mind, he'd say, you're all alone. You're all alone. And then like when I'd feel lonely, then he'd, he'd lay in this other layer and he'd be like, and nobody loves you. And then he'd lay in this other layer eventually and he'd say, and you always will be. And these were just thoughts I had as a kid. And then like, and then life happens. And then like, you know, people start dying and like all of a sudden that worldview makes sense. How many of you know that's not the truth? I will never leave you nor forsake you. I didn't have that verse. Ah, I just didn't know it. I didn't have the building material. I didn't have this verse. So like, I, I couldn't, I couldn't apply it. But then how many of you guys know, I eventually came across it. And I remember the day when that, when that feeling, cause how many of you guys know that Satan can actually apply emotion to you? And he ap applied that feeling of loneliness. And he said, you're all alone and nobody cares. 
And I remember I was, I was in college. I was feeling lonely. I had a really hard time my first semester at college. And I was, I was all alone because that's what he does. And he said that to me. And I said, I'm not alone. Jesus is in the room with me. And it was the first time. Oh, excuse me. It was the first time that I threw that verse. Get rid of these. These peop people are so distracted by these bright colors. They can hardly think. So it was the first time that I actually applied the verse. I actually had the wisdom to not just know the verse, but actually speak the verse in the circumstance that the verse needed to be set in. All right, you're dismissed, right? But it's just one verse changed my life. Do you know what he doesn't do anymore? He doesn't ever tell me that. Because I've built a house around that verse that can't be blown over. But I used to have one of hay. I used to have one of sticks. And now I finally have a brick house that can't be blown over when it comes to that. And like, it's, I, I remember when the Holy Spirit reads you this word, and I'm not telling you, like, I think all, all we do is we, we open this up, and we're like, I gotta read the Bible, I gotta read the Bible. You need to take a verse and learn to apply it. That's what you need to do. That's like the ultimate discipleship. Let's take one verse, the verse that you need, Whatever the enemy is telling you, I can guarantee you this word is saying the opposite. And you find it and you memorize it and you apply it. Then there's verses in here that is, that is your actual calling in life. This is, this is so cool. Do you, know what, do you know what verse that I'm working on? I want to be the outward expression of this verse. Are you guys ready? God gives grace to the humble. I want to be the person, when, when you look at me, you'd say, I didn't know a person could hold that much grace. Look at the grace that God has put on this person's life. How did he do that? I'd say he gives grace to the humble and he's working on it with me and I have to discover new ways to humble myself. Do you know what? Um, Bethany Hicks was here and uh, Danny McCollum was here and they were doing that prophetic weekend. And do you know, this is, this is so interesting. We were doing these prophetic exercises and uh, Bethany Hicks said to me, your name is Adam Bauer. And this is what I hear the Lord saying. Your name is Adam, which means you're the first, and you're a, a bower, but it means a, a bower as in one who bows low. And you're going to teach people how to humble themselves. And I'd already had this verse in my heart, and I already decided I wanted to be the expression of this on the earth. It just did something for me. And I love when God comes along and cheers you on in what it is that you're actually pursuing in him. So there's something that we need to decide now, okay? If you think your house is already made out of bricks and that it's not made out of hay or twigs, we could have a problem on our hand because it could still get blown over. But if it gets blown over, then we need to come to the conclusion that I have not, maybe the material isn't right, maybe I don't have the understanding, and maybe I don't have the wisdom. But no person in here is meant to have your life blown flat. I've had my life blown flat, but this is what I didn't do. God, what happened? Why did you allow this to happen? No, why haven't I taken this word yet and understood it and applied it in such a way that the house couldn't get blown over? And this is, this is what I find, this is, this is like, as I, as I get older in the Lord, do you know what just is, is blaringly obvious between someone who's immature and someone who's mature? This is so glaring to me. The person who's immature thinks God is doing everything. The person that's mature understands the part you play. Did you know that Adam and Eve played a part in this word? They, I know I'm gonna have to stay, I'm gonna have to talk to them one day, but they blew it, right? I'm not saying I haven't blown it, I've blown it too, but like they blew it. They played a part. There, there was like, when Moses was in the wilderness, there, he had a vision, and this is what, ugh. I'm going to tell you this, and you're going to believe it. Are you ready? God wants all men to be saved. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Is that biblical? Are all men going to be saved? No. Does God have desires for mankind, but just because he has the desire, is he, is he going to make it happen? Or is there a participation yeah, okay, now, now get ready for this. This is like the seatbelt time. Are you guys ready? Does God have desires for your life? 
Are you going to see them all come to pass? We'll find out, right? We'll find out. Because I guarantee you, he has verses in here that you're supposed to be the living manifestation of. We're going to find out one day if we get to see what he desires. He has a calling in your life. You're called to a specific verse in here to be the living manifestation of that verse on the earth. Doesn't that sound fun? It's not like, well, I'm going to wake up. Like, I, like, I read the Bible every day, but it's not like, okay, I'm done. It's like, no, like, what's your verse? What's the verse that you're going to be the living manifestation on? So that when he's up in heaven, he could say, look at my verse down there. Look at my verse and what they're becoming. They're becoming the living manifestation of my word, and it's not returning void. Look at the fruit it's producing. That sounds fun to me. But like, like, Moses played a part. And I said this last week, Moses played a part. He didn't believe God when he called him to go to Pharaoh. And because of his stubbornness, Aaron had to get involved. Aaron wasn't supposed to be involved in the way that he was. And things didn't turn out exactly the way they were supposed to. Because God had a desire for Moses and Moses didn't believe God. So then Aaron had to get involved in a way that Aaron wasn't supposed to get involved. And then the people are there and they send out spies and these spies went. They were supposed to come back and report that they had good fruit, but they decided to report that there's giants in the land. That wasn't their job, but they decided to make it their job and they caused disbelief to come. And because that disbelief came, all those people, except for two of them, died in the wilderness. Was it God's desire that they die in the wilderness? Of course not. Did they? Yes. But when you're immature in Christ, you just think, well, God's just going to do it all. It's like, no, you're directly involved. Is your house going to be made out of brick? I don't know. Is it? And that's why when I ask, what's the rock made of? Everyone yells Jesus, not obedience. But obedience is what the rock is, the solid foundation that the house is built on. It directly involves you. So is your house going to get knocked over? I don't know. It kind of depends on the whole obedience thing. The storm's coming no matter what. How many of you guys know the floor is going to drop out five or six times in your life? That doesn't mean you have to drop out with it. It all depends on what you're building the house out of and whether or not you you figured out not just have a bunch of building materials, but have actually taken some of them and actually built something with them. I'm sorry, I'm pretty passionate about this. I'm pretty passionate about it because I was under the delusion that as long as I had the materials, God would build the house. And I, I, I've come to find out that's not the case. I've had my house blown down a few times. And eventually you get tired of it. And it's not his fault. It's, God, I have, I have lacked the wisdom to actually build this thing correctly. Would you come and show me, Holy Spirit, how this is actually done? And forgive me for my pride. And here was my pride. Like, I would, read, I would read this word. We view this book through salvation. And Jesus was speaking it through wisdom. So like when we read the parables, we're like, oh, there's, there's five foolish virgins and five wise. And I'm the wise one because I'm saved. That makes me wise. And there's sheep and there's goats and I'm a sheep because I'm saved. And, and there's, and there's um, foolish servants and, and wise servants and I'm, I'm, I'm the wise one because I'm saved. And it's like, no, like wisdom means do, do not. Did you accept Jesus Christ into your heart? So all the parables of Jesus are based on whether or not you're doing what it is that he's saying. And then we come back with our version of Christianity from the 19th century. And these, anyway, we come back and say, no, like what Jesus meant is, are you saved? Did you accept Jesus Christ into your heart? And that's not what Jesus was saying. He's saying, are you doing what I'm saying? And that's what it comes down to. Are you doing what he's saying? And I'm not saying like, well, hey, get to it. What I'm saying is just start with one verse. Start with one verse and believe it. And there'll be fruit from it. Just one. I'll I'll never forget the verse where I found out that I didn't have to be offended at people anymore. Doesn't that sound like a good life? How many of you would like to not be offended at anybody anymore? So I'll go, okay, here it is. Are you guys ready? It's not a battle against flesh and blood. Done. So if you really believe that, if you really believe it's not a battle against flesh and blood, your battle's never with people. 
and you understand that there's a spiritual battle going on and that people are the tool that the enemy uses and odds are if somebody's being used by the enemy, guess what? It's probably because they're not walking closely with the Lord. So poor them, not poor you. That's why unforgiveness doesn't make sense. What, what are you, what are you, you're going to be, you're going to take something that the devil's doing through someone personally as if that person has done something to you. Meanwhile, the enemy's just using them like a puppet to get you to be offended and have unforgiveness. So you're going to be upset with a person, which by the way, if they're not Christian, they're just, according to the word, they're just a house of demons, Right? If we need to talk about that afterwards, we can. So why would you ever have unforgiveness towards somebody? And if they are a Christian, supposedly, well, then they must not be walking closely with the Lord if they're not loving, right? It's not a battle against flesh and blood. Done. We can, we can put it away. Or can we? I don't know. It depends if you want to pull that out and actually build something with it. Building a house that can never be offended. There's a verse in the Bible that says this, consider yourself dead to sin. How many of you would like to consider yourself dead to sin? It's a command in the Bible. Do you know what that means? It means that when the enemy comes with temptation, did you ever have somebody say, you're dead to me? You're dead to me, get out of here. That's what you can say to the devil in his temptation. Oh, no one's home, buddy. You don't have to answer the door. The Bible gives you permission to never have to answer the door when temptation comes. Yeah, but you don't understand. Like, I'm tempted. Yes, it's a temptation. Where does temptation come from? This, this took me forever. Please don't take as long as it took me. You've been washed clean in Christ. Satan's out here now. He's not in here. He's out here seeing if you'll let him in. But it's out here now. It's not in here. This is the inside of the cup has been clean. Can everyone, t can you say that? Raise your hand if the inside cup, of, cup has been clean. And what I mean is, is that you've been baptized into Christ. So what's, so like this is, and I don't know why this is so hard for us to understand, but so that would make you righteous, pure. Is that good news? Yeah, but I don't always have pure thoughts. They're not your thoughts. They're his. And he's a tempter. So why would you ever, like, if, if, if I'm outside of you and I'm saying this, you're a loser. I guess I'm a loser. What? It's for some, something is saying something to you, not inside of you being it. You never have to listen to what the enemy's saying. You can consider yourself dead to sin. Now, if you want to take that verse and build a house, you can go ahead and do that. Or you can simply know that that's Romans 6, 11, but that won't do you any good. It's when temptation comes that you have to stand against it and actually apply the verse. Say, sorry, no one's home. Father, thank you that I'm righteous and these thoughts aren't mine. Anyway. Is it, God, is it God's like... God would never ask us to be something that we, not, that we aren't in him. And what I mean by that is like when I was younger as a Christian and I used to see the things like God would be like, don't sin anymore. And I'd be like, geez, that's a tall order, dude. It's kind of hard considering I'm a sinner. And like, I, I, didn't, I didn't know I wasn't a sinner. I didn't know I was a saint. I didn't know I was in the body of Christ. I didn't know I was made righteous. I just didn't have the right building materials to actually build the right house that he was actually calling me to build. Is this new information? Does everybody know this? Do you guys know this stuff? And you might say, I know it, but I'm not applying it. We can start applying it. It's worth applying. Because when God asks you to love people, it's because he's actually put himself inside of you. And he's love. So he's not sharing that space with something else. The cup's been filled with himself. And he's asking you to express who he is on the earth, not as a dirty sinner, but as a new creation in Christ. 
He's asking you to be who it is that he's made you to be. Not, I know you're this way, but try hard not to be this way anymore. Guys, I've run out of time. I just want to say, tell you these six things. Are you guys ready? I'm just going to use this as an example. We're going to use the, uh, it's not a battle against flesh and blood anymore. Just go to the last slide. Here it is. If you're going to become the living example, because how many of you guys know that one day your life, everybody says, well, I'm going to be in heaven one day. That is true. Amen. But you're going to stand before him one day. You're going to give an account. The way Paul describes this is that he's going to take your life. It's going to be put in the fire. And we're going to see what your life was made of. Hay, wood, and stubble, or gold, silver, and precious jewels. And I'm not telling you to believe what it is that I heard from the Lord, but I asked him one day and I said, what are the precious jewels? And he said, they are the verses that you were able to have the wisdom to manifest in your life. And I'm talking three or four would be great. One or two would be awesome. But they are the verses that you were able to manifest on the earth. The living manifestation of these verses, right, is the precious jewel. And so... I don't know about you guys, but like, it's not hard. You just pick one. Whatever the enemy's saying, if it needs to be an internal verse, whatever, if he's telling you that you're all alone, you just say, Lord, thank you for never leaving me nor forsaking me. You just find the verse of whatever he's saying. Guys, everybody have Google? Whatever the enemy's saying, flip it and say, give me the verse that says this. It'll come up for you. It's not even hard. You don't even have to pour over this stuff for hours. You just Google it. And then you can Google, can you give me two verses that backs that up? Give me two witnesses to this verse so that I know that this verse is true. And then I want you to memorize the verse. I want you to memorize the verse and get it into your heart. And then I want you to do what you can do in the natural. And what I mean by, by this is, whenever the enemy knows that you're working on a verse, get ready for all hell to break out in that area because he wants to take you down and make sure that that verse never actually bears fruit. And I remember, I remember um, I was working on understanding that I'd become righteous in Christ, not because of anything that I was living righteously, but he imparted righteousness to me through the blood. And I was like, Lord, I'm righteous. Like you've made me righteous, Lord. I've never had so many people come to me and tell me how much of an awful person I am. It, it was actually comical. And people would come and say, who, who do you think you are? I'm the righteousness of Christ. I might not be manifesting it fully, but the word says that I am, and it's in here, and I'm trying to believe it and actually build a house out of that verse so that I don't have to like revert to like sin all the time. I don't know the righteousness of Christ. So what, how many of you have, um, let's just, I love my in-laws. I'm just using them as an example. Well, let's say I have in-laws, right? And I'm over there visiting them. And they say to me like, um, do you still have that same old job? Like that. And I'm like, excuse me, I have to go to the bathroom. And I go into the bathroom. I say, Father, this isn't a battle against flesh and blood. It's a battle against the darkness and principalities, Father. And I thank you that I just bless them. And awesome, God, you're amazing. Yes, I do. I do have the same job. Thank you for asking. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> right? <laughs> that wasn't hard. You just, you just go to the bathroom. Don't spend too much time in there. They'll get suspicious. <laughs> but you just come back out. You just say, yeah, hey. If you're ever talking to me and I excuse myself to go to the bathroom, you know what I'm doing. <laughs> so what, what can you do in the natural? Well, one, one, one thing is, is that, and I actually have it listed on here, is you need to be able to quote the verse when it counts. If you can't quote the verse when it counts, it doesn't matter that you know the verse. It's part of the wisdom aspect of things. Get counsel from those that are walking in that wisdom already. Is there anybody that you know that just really, when you think of that verse, that's who you think of? Go talk to them. Ask them how the Lord taught them that verse. Ask them everything they know. How come, how come you seem to be so unoffended? 
Like, tell me your history with God. How did God get you to this place where like your heart just seems pure when it comes to offense? Say no to the opposite living and thinking and declare the truth and live that truth. Submit to God and the devil will flee. I'm, I'm telling you, when you are able to actually stand, on a, stand in the moment on a verse when it counts, like, have you guys ever been plagued by loneliness? Like, has that ever happened? Okay. Like, uh, me too, get it. And it's like, whenever I got a hold of that verse, and it said this, it, it says that he would never leave you nor forsake you. When I understood that, and here's what it looked like. I used to have to like, I couldn't bear to be by myself. And this was like before cell phones. Okay, I'm, I'm not 26. I'm in my 40s. All right, I know. But <laughs> there was a time when we didn't have cell phones and I had to get in my car and go find people, okay? Because um, I didn't want to talk to their parents on the house phone. So I would just get in my car and just drive to people's houses and see if their car was there. But I was so desperate not to be by myself. And do you know why the devil didn't want me to be by myself? Because he knew that I actually wasn't and he didn't want me to fellowship with God. So I was driven to be around people all the time. And then eventually, when I got a hold of this verse, I didn't mind being by myself because I found out that I never actually was. And I could actually fellowship with God. I could actually spend time with God. And I looked forward to being by myself because that meant that I get to, get to hang out with the, with the one who wanted to hang out with me. The whole time, God's been dying to hang out with me. And I didn't know it. He's dying to hang out with you. That's why the devil doesn't want you to be, able to, doesn't want you to be by yourself because he's afraid you're going to fellowship with him. Take a risk that requires God to show up. Um, there's, there's I, I, like, of course, we don't go throw ourselves off buildings. What I'm talking about is this. What I'm saying is, um, I, was, I was just at Hershey Park the other day, and uh, I'm just walking along, and I just have a, I have a conviction around praying for people. It's just a conviction that I have, and if I go somewhere, like, why wouldn't God want to do something? And I'm standing next to this person and I feel like there's something wrong with their back. I just have a feeling and I feel like it's the Lord. And, uh, and at the same time, they're with their family. There's a crowd there. And I'm like, I don't want to say any of this stuff in front of these people. And uh, here we go. Now, now Satan's playing ping pong with me about this in my own mind. I just said, hey, how are you doing? He said, looked at me like I was crazy. And because uh, it looks like you're trying to sell something. And I said, do you have pain in your back? And he said, yes. And I said, do you have pain right here? And he said, yes. And I said, could I, could I pray for you? And he said, no. And I said, well, have a good day. And I was like, yes. I did it. Why? Because it doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter what happens. It only matters that like you're a willing vessel, right? And it's like, I'm telling you, like, was it a risk? Yeah, but like, what do, what do I got to lose, right? It's like, Man, God, God, stepping out with God is one of the funnest things to do in the world. I, I, hate, I hate the few moments before I do. It's so stupid, I feel like a child. But after I do, I always feel the best. Thank you, God, for giving me the courage. Amen? So take a risk that requires God to show up. That's actually what faith is. Okay. Would you guys stand with me? Thanks for letting me go over a little bit. Can I just give you guys an assignment? For those of you guys who follow our discussion questions, we'll send you out these six things. This is my assignment for you. If you're struggling, struggling with something internally, please find the verse that you need to stand on and build a house around. If you're not struggling internally, then you're actually like, but you're struggling externally. You don't understand what your calling is. Find the verse that God's calling you to and become that verse. Would you, could you guys do that? It's some pretty simple discipleship. And I feel like sometimes we get lost in the generality of scripture instead of just finding the verse that God's calling us to. So I'm gonna pray that God would give you wisdom around the verse, whether you're struggling internally, because if you're struggling internally, he wants to help you with that. But if you're not struggling internally and you're like, hey, life's, you know, everything's going pretty well. There's, there's something that he wants you to be externally for this world. And he wants to point out to all of the beings in heaven, look at my son, look at my daughter. They're the manifestation of my word. I think that's pretty exciting. 
So Father, I pray for every single person in here, Lord, that if anyone in here is struggling, that you would show them the verse that they need, that they could build a house out of and actually apply, and that, you would, that, that, that it would be such a strong house that no matter what storm come, it would not blow down. And Lord, I pray for those who do not understand what their calling yet is. Would you reveal the verse that reveals the calling on their life? In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you guys. Have a great Sunday. Thank you for joining us at Praise Community Church. We pray that today's sermon has touched your heart. For more information about our church, upcoming events, or to connect with us, visit praiseyork.com. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow us on social media. We look forward to seeing you next week.